first of all, want to thank the department for making visiting arts funds available to us. It's a really essential part of our experience. And I want to express my gratitude uh, to Dan for pinning Catherine down, because we know that was no uh, easy feat. <laughs> um, so um, we're really um, joyful to have uh, Catherine here. And it, it's always a great occasion when there's someone whose work you've followed for a long time, who's really been making significant marks in this field. And, and Catherine is uh, that for me, and I think for, for many of our students and, and colleagues in the field. Um, she uh, comes to us from Los Angeles, where she currently lives. She moved to the West Coast as a student to do her undergraduate work at the San Francisco um, Art Institute. And then from there, did her graduate work at CalArts and graduated in 89? 88. 88. Close. Close. Um, and I, are you going to be showing any of your thesis work as a part of this? No. Well, her, her, um, her thesis work um, was called the Master Plan, and it was uh, looking at what was happening in Valencia at the time. Um, and um, uh, it was a significant um, documentary effort, and I think brings her back to her initial interest in photography. She described it occurring when she was a child and was given a camera and discovered or discovered the work of Lewis Hine and was given a camera. I don't know which order that goes in, but her uh, but her fixation really has been uh, with a documentary approach and, and describes herself as just sort of wandering around with her camera describing the world in which she lives, more or less. I'm really used to paraphrasing. <laughs> um, after graduate school, um, she was dedicated to be uh, pursuing her art and moved uh, into LA and took up a job at Irvine as a lab tech, and um, from there she really made her mark on the world. Um, it was in, oh, I'm going to have my dates wrong, 94, 95, 94, 95. Okay. Um, she was included in the Whitney Biennial, and that's a pretty good career strategy for anybody who kind of wants to know like how to make it out of a lab tech position and, and into the world. Um, that worked for Catherine very well. Um, and she found herself uh, with some really magnificent uh, teaching offers and opportunities that um, grew out of that, including an appointment at Yale and where she is currently um, at UCLA. Um, it, it, her exhibition record is, is rich and long and impressive, just even looking at just the you know, recent last couple of years. Significant one-person shows. We have to, of course, hold up the Portland Art Museum as being the venue for one of those. But um, it includes uh, shows in LA, in Berlin, in Milan. Um, she's been included in the Whitney not just once, but but twice um, in Site Santa Fe's Biennial. Uh, it's it's just it, it's an amazing track record. Um, so we're delighted to have her here in humble Eugene. Uh, please welcome Catherine Ovi. thank the University of Oregon for inviting me. And also, you guys have one hell of a football team that I love, actually. <laughs> I just had to add that in there, because usually artists don't talk about football. But you know, I'll be one of those that do talk about football. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give a little bit of a, of a background, especially with this first image. Can we take the spotlight off me, or do I have to have that on? Ah, thank you. <laughs> I'd be like squinting at you for the entire lecture. Um, this is actually <clears throat> the catalyst of me writing a book report on Lewis Hine when I was nine years old and asking my parents for a camera on my, on my birthday. So this is my first self-portrait in front of my house in Sandusky, Ohio. And I always like starting the lecture with this because I've, I'm always kind of profoundly interest, interested in the fact that a lot of what we were interested in our youth actually is something that we follow through with in certain ideas of a practice. So I had told my parents, you know, I want to be a social documentary photographer. I need a camera for my birthday. And then I went around photographing my town of Sandusky, Ohio. So I would photograph all the stop signs, you know, the cornfields, like kind of just, you know, almost mapping out to a certain ex extent what I looked at every day. For some reason, this is the practice that I've continued with throughout my entire life, is a, a sense of mapping. And so one of the things that was talked about um, in the introduction was that uh, while I was at CalArts, I did a very large body of work that I'm not going to show this evening, but it was called the Master Plan. 
And in a certain way, it was, it really began to format as much of gra sometimes graduate schools can do the exploration of the last uh, 20 odd years and more of my practice. And one of the questions that I asked and through all the various bodies of work, which is, is they're somewhat prolific, um, is the specificity of identity and relationship to place and community. And in terms of that exploration, it's very vast. And uh, what happened was, I'm going to start out with 1990, even though I graduated in 88 um, from CalArts. And after I went, I did a body of work of the master plan, and then I did a body of work around MacArthur Park with the uh, subway going in called A Long Way From Paris. And then I really decided, it was really interesting because at CalArts I had these really profound, kind of amazing out queer professors who kept saying to me the whole time I was there, why aren't you making queer art? We know you used to photograph for On Our Backs. Why aren't you making queer work, you know? And, and I kept saying, well, I actually believe that documenting master plan communities in relationship to building a discourse around it and kind of an examination and, and looking at them in a certain way is queer work. So what defines kind of a queer artist? How do we begin to look at that? How do we define ourselves within our own practice? And what was happening was uh, around 1990, I was losing an enormous amount of friends from AIDS. I watched my community decimated in San Francisco as well as Los Angeles. And I decided that it was time to go into the studio and make kind of a body of work. So the first body of work was more of a fun body of work because I moved from San Francisco as this out leather dyke and I landed in Los Angeles, the land of lipstick lesbians. And there wasn't much room for a butch identity in LA. Like they really were just like, what do we do with you? And I was like, I don't know, what do you do with me? And so all my friends in, in L.A., I, uh, I had them go and buy fake mustaches at the Hollywood wig store. So this body of work is titled Being and Having. And everybody has a nickname. So this is Pigpen, Jake. And these are all shot four by five. At this point, I'm working uh, entirely in large format. And I was really interested in the fact that the mustache was utterly readable in the image. But there were so many people, just like the, just like today at the Starbucks at the airport, uh, they said, excuse me, sir. And I was like, ah, oh, no, not a sir. <laughs> but not a ma'am either. <laughs> and, uh, but it was, you know, that the, it, they automatically assumed this kind of male identity in relationship to looking at them. So the first place they showed, one of the first places was at UC Santa Barbara at the museum. And, uh, this young woman who worked in the museum came up to me after the show was coming down and she was like, you know, I think I know some of those guys. And I was like, oh, huh, well, they're all lesbians with fake mustaches. And she was like, no. I was like, yeah, see the glue, the webbing? You know, but it's so interesting because at that point, and if you think about kind of the history of the way that women are photographed as well, they're not used to that stare back. That stare back kind of rarely happens. I mean, you look at the work of Gregory Crutzen and the women are always like standing in dirt, kind of looking off, you know. There's a, there's a lot of gazing off and never really gazing at the camera. This is Papa Bear, Jay, Luigi, oh so bad. Um, I think actually this is Papa Bear. I'm forgetting their names now. Whitey. Chicken. And this is the installation view. And one of the things that I'm going to be doing in this lecture is I'm going to kind of be walking you through loosely, not all the images that were exhibited, but um, a few years back, I had a, a mid-career survey at the Guggenheim Museum, which included uh, 200 photographs on four floors. And so this is uh, one of the floors in which the being and, being and having was exhibited before you went into a bigger room. And after I did being and having, I kind of loved being in the studio. And I loved kind of working with colored backgrounds. And I loved kind of, kind of thinking about my friends in relationship to it. 
And I started to, to really feel that it was very important to make a body of work at this period of time in which so much um, identity politics was, was being, uh, being looked at in, in creating a discourse within the art world, but also in a larger kind of public uh, context. And especially with losing so many friends from AIDS, I felt like that it was time to kind of create this family um, album. My inspiration behind making the portraits uh, was the painter Hans Holbein. And I wanted to use like color in a way that I felt like color hadn't really been used before. So this body of work was made from 1990 to 95. And this is Crystal Cross and Justin Bond. Christian. And it had to do a lot with my friends in relationship to the body. And in a certain way, with all my interest in terms of community and architecture, I really started viewing the body as a site of architecture, as a site of place, as a site of identity. And I wanted to really begin to look at that in terms of isolating them on color, because I felt like for the majority of the work that I had seen of the gay and lesbian community, it was always body parts. So it was the pierced nipple, it was just the tattooed arm, it was all fragmented. And I wanted to kind of defragment it and, and create a certain kind of humble uh, portrait of, of this community who was primarily the leather, the leather community both in Los Angeles and San Francisco. This is Mike and Skye, John and Scott, Crystal Mason, and in a certain way, I'm really interested in the notion of seduction, the idea of beauty, the idea of how do you look at a community that's somewhat on a fringe, that it often at this point in 1990 where there wasn't a lot of piercing and tattooing, I mean, now you can't, you know, it's, it's part of uh, mainstream culture. Um, but I wanted to, in a certain way, use this kind of trope of it making incredibly formal portraits so that I could hold the viewer. And what was that in relationship to holding a viewer? This is Diana DeMassa, Jeff, Angela Hanschail, Daddy Irwin and his boy Mark. Alistair Fate, Pig Pen, Mitch, Skeeter and her brother Richard, Richard. Raylan Galena, Chloe, Frankie. I've always viewed photography in a certain way, and I think that I've often thought about it in this way in terms of what has inspired me and the work that I look at um, in relationship to an idea of a history that it's an accumulation of history and that photography acts as the pure document in relationship to our own history. Um, I've never really thought of photography in relationship to an ultimate truth and so much in terms of photography and the criticism of uh, critical writing of photography speaks about it as somewhat of seeking a truth. I've never really viewed it as a truth. I've viewed it as a source of not only my own memory but also a collective memory in terms of how we view place and how we, we begin to you know, just see uh, time shift. And it's interesting because at the time I was making these portraits, these were actually really radical portraits. And I don't think that they are radical whatsoever anymore. You know? And it's so interesting in relationship to that idea of history. This is James. And this is James's lover, Miguel who weighed about 95 pounds when I took this photograph and died uh, a week later of AIDS. Um, and the, one of the things that was always amazing um, in relationship to doing this is it was very emotional and very hard. But at the memorial service, there was a stack of prints that people could take to remember Miguel by. 
Millie Wilson, who was one of my professors at CalArts, a very influential professor of mine. And then from the portraits, the portraits range in size from about 16 by 20 to 20 by 24. And they were printed. And I'm very interested in the materiality of photography. Like I'm very connected to not only technical, the technical aspect of the medium, but also what material does. So the material I printed them, these portraits on at the time was almost, uh, the, the, it was a type C material for those photographers out there who know what the hell I'm talking about. And it was, uh, Cibachrome had made it for type C negative, so it was a super glossy paper. But these are printed on regular matte paper, and these are 30 by 60 inches in size. And I looked at them as more a performative aspect of, of the portrait. So they weren't, you know, they weren't really talking about kind of queer performance and, and a little bit of gender fuck at the time. So this is Trash. This is Bo, again. Bo was a used car, uh, used aluminum side salesman from Ohio as a persona. Very unsuccessful used aluminum side salesman. Ron Athey. Vaginal Cream Davis. Mitch again, and when I had my exhibition at the Guggenheim, it was kind of amazing because this was the banner all down Fifth Avenue. And it was so great because I would see like these young lesbian couples like posing underneath the banner on Fifth Ave next to the park. And it was just like this really kind of fabulous moment where all of a sudden Mitch was this banner for the exhibition. This is Renee. Divinity Fudge. and Justin Bond hailing a cab. And then within it were the series that uh, dealt with kind of identity and relationship to the identity being written on the body or using the body in that way. So I did, decided to use these upholstery fab fabric backgrounds because I wanted kind of to evoke that 17th century kind of history of painting and fabrics and lushness. And I think that painting has always been an important discourse within my work as well as the history of photography. But my friend uh, Stake in 1991 tattooed a uh, dyke on the back of her neck. And I just thought that was such an incredibly bold thing to do. And then in 1993, I made self-portrait cutting. And it's uh, two stick figure girls holding hands with a cloud and the sun coming out from the cloud. And it was really symbolic on many levels in relationship to the body politic at that point in art. And also in terms of my first uh, domestic relationship breaking up. So we had broken up and for a year I had drawn this on a pad next to the telephone and just kept drawing it. And then I decided that it was, even though I had been um, kind of practicing, um, you know, SM in San Francisco for years and years and years. I had never brought it out in my work because I thought, I can't do this. I'm never going to get a teaching job. I have worked so hard to get my bachelor's and my master's degree, and I really want to teach, and this is it. This is, if I make work like this, this is going to be the end of my career. But you shouldn't really think that. You shouldn't put those kinds of uh, little like questions in your mind, and so I decided to go ahead and make the piece. And you know, it really symbolizes a lot, and it also symbolizes for me what, what kids draw at school and kindergarten in terms of the representation of family. And in fact, now that I have a nine-year-old son, when he was five, he actually drew two stick figure girls, but they weren't wearing skirts because Julie and I never wear dresses. And it was you know, this kind of thought of like, yeah, this is, this, at this point, this wasn't being used even in relationship to the representation of, of, um, of family. The following year, in 1994, I made Pervert. And Pervert was a little bit angrier of a piece. And what I mean by angrier is it's very precise, and it's my Henry VIII. It's like my Holbein Henry VIII. And what had happened was the March on Washington started really talking about this kind of normalization of, of gay culture, that uh, they had even adopted the, the word that there were normal gays and lesbians, and then there, the, there were those perverts, those S&M people to the side. 
And it really upset me. And I was, so I, in the same way that steak put dyke on, the, on her body, I had Pervert by Raylan Galena, who's an amazing body artist, do a, do a cutting. And then the leather hood was just to hide my identity because I wanted the identity to be on the body. And then 10 years later, um, no, maybe, yeah, not 10, maybe eight, nine years later, I did self-portrait nursing. And self-portrait nursing, you can still really see within the print, all of these prints are 30 by 40 inches in size. You can really still see pervert on the body. And it was one of the things that it was important, obviously, for me to make this piece as a, as a mother, but also kind of as um, playing with the history of, of imagery in terms of Madonna and child and what representation does that the queer body can have children. Um, but also, um, I like that I'm an older woman. I'm 41 in this photograph. Um, it, was, it was reviewed in Art in America, and the writer in parentheses had to kind of put her own judgment call. She didn't do it in the review of the piece, but she did it in parentheses, where she said that the child looked too old to be nursing. And he's a year old. And, you know, I think, you know, it was just so amazing to me that that's where she had to kind of put her own judgment call in relationship to the act of my motherhood. Um, this is an installation in the Guggenheim of the portraits. And then this little alcove in the back held um, first time ever uh, shown together dyke uh, self-portrait cutting uh, self-portrait nursing and self-portrait pervert. And then in 94-95, I made a radical transition back to the landscape, back to the environment. Out of several reasons, one, I was inspired to do so. The other was that at this point I had gotten an enormous amount of attention for my work of portraits. And I was basically going to possibly pigeon my hole myself as an artist uh, to be the kind of, you know, lesbian dyke photographer of my generation. And I, even though I was perfectly happy with that identity and perfectly, you know, pleased to have done something so important in relationship to creating representations of my own community, it's not the totality of me. It's not that, that I'm a singular identity. And I have many multitude interests in relationship to creating ideas of representation. So I was uh, teaching, I was, not, I was the lab tech at Irvine, and I lived in LA, and it takes five freeways to go to work uh, five days a week, and it's an hour drive. So my hour commute really started making me be aware of the structures of the freeways and also how, how they identify Los Angeles as a space. And so this is how they're, they're, um, they're not ever um, installed linearly. They're, they're installed in a group as if you're kind of traversing a freeway in itself. And they're very small platinum prints. And they're done with a Fuji G617 camera, and then they're just platinum prints. And so they are done on Sunday mornings, very empty. I did not want cars in them. And then there's just these really quiet, very formal images of the structures. And I wanted to make them platinum prints because I wanted to kind of evoke a, you know, turn of the century period of photography, thinking about the Egyptian pyramids and thinking about like this, these different collections and how that these structures also in a certain way, 150 years from now might dictate a certain kind of way that we inhabited Los Angeles as a city. And um, so with that, that's why platinum and, and why like kind of creating these, these quiet moments within the landscape. And I'm really interested in terms of thinking about bodies of work in the way that I was talking about, you know, the material, materials early on that I do believe that in a certain way um, scale and the materiality should be completely considered in relationship to the bodies of work that I build. And then from that, I made this very odd, very awkward body of work in 1995 of Beverly Hills Houses in Bel Air. And at this point, I'm photographing with an 8x10 camera. 
And they were kind of, they're kind of a little bit like real estate photographs, but they're an eight by 10 camera and they're 40 by 50 inch prints that I printed all myself in a mural room. And I kind, they felt to me not like architectural photographs. I wasn't trying to be, you know, Shulman. I wasn't trying to evoke any type of uh, history of architecture within this work. But I was trying to really talk about portraiture to a certain extent with these houses. That the facades to me really related to the early portraits. That they were as much borrowed from history as my friends who were tattooing and piercing and scarring their bodies were. And so you would have these Pullman doors with these shake roofs, these mansard roofs with, you know, just these very kind of odd postmodern notion of architecture in the, in the mid 1950s. You would have these facades that would end up looking like they were a Hollywood facade with a hillside coming out of the back. And I think that in a certain way also, I'm really interested in this notion of what becomes iconic and how we think of what, uh, what is iconic. And I'm trying to play with this a little bit at this point in, in thinking about work. And what I mean by that is that, you know, shows like 90210 would never show a house like this. You know, it was always the Bel Air in Beverly Hills has this other kind of dream of mansion, even though many of the houses that exist consist of, of this, this time period. Um, in, the, in the Guggenheim, there was an installation of domestic, which is a body of work I'll go into next. And then I really tried to mirror that installation in the museum, as I do with all my exhibitions. Whenever I do an exhibition, I have a model of the space. And in the model of the space, I install the work. And I work it and work it and work it over and over again until it feels right. I feel that architecture needs to also dictate the way that an installation begins to look. And so the houses, being so utterly awkward, ended up being installed in somewhat of a very awkward you know, um, place in, in the Guggenheim as well. So domestic, in 1998, I took a road trip. And I bought an RV. And I quit my job. I quit being a lab tech. And I was kind of adjunct teaching here and there, but I didn't really have a job. And I spent three and a half months on the road with uh, my dog, my wonderful Australian Shepherd, Nika, going around America finding lesbian households to make 8 by 10 photographs of. Um, one of the reasons is that I wanted to, again, create a representation of domesticity that I felt wasn't there. The other is a very long, I think that it's important for artists to have conversations. I think that art is one long conversation. And so the conversation that I'm also having here is with Tina Barney. So it's also in relationship to uh, Peter Galassi's show at MoMA, Pleasure and Terror and Domestic Comfort. So in a certain way, a lot of what I feel is not kind of um, written so to speak, in the history books, I feel that it's important for me as an artist to bring up those quandaries, to bring up those questions in relationship to creating actual representations. So this is Miggy and Eileen. Eileen gave birth to twins the day after this photograph. And this is Los Angeles. This is Tammy Ray and Kaya in Durham, North Carolina. And I really look at these, you know, as a source of document, but obviously they also completely play with staged photography. And I mean, that is partly of thinking about Tina Barney and the way that she uses her 8x10 camera as well as Sally Mann. So it's in, a, it's in conversation with what was happening at that point historically in photography. This is a Kim and Juliet with Kellen. This is Joanne Betsy and their daughter, Olivia. So the scenes are really lit. I mean, I'm bringing strobes in. I'm putting little mini strobes in, you know, uh, basically you can even tell that it's in the lamp in the background. I'm like triggering everything with slaves. I'm also still trying to you know, kind of bring up a little bit of a, of, of a conversation with, you know, Dutch painting to a certain extent in the way that I'm lighting some of these. This is um, 
Patty and Deb in their apartment in New York. Christopher Clara in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Emily and uh, these names I always forget because it's like T-S and K. And this is in Durham. Melissa and her partner, um, uh, this is my old apartment building in Los Angeles actually and they were breaking up and so this is their lesbian garage sale. And they're still being like good lesbians and helping each other out even in the midst of a breakup. Norma and Iwana in, uh, in Minneapolis. Melissa and Lake, Durham, North Carolina. So what I would go, do is I would like basically find a friend that had a, a socket if I could because I didn't really like staying in the RV parks because the RV parks were just weird. So I had like all my 8x10 equipment. I had stacks and stacks and stacks of boxes of film in the refrigerator in my RV. Um, I had all my strobes and I kind of lived in it and I would plug into their wall socket. And then I would try to give a lecture wherever I was going in whatever town and I'd have them pay me in cash so that I would have enough gas money to get to the next place. And then the first place that I developed all my 8x10 film because I was freaking out that none of it was coming out because I couldn't afford to shoot Polaroid with it was uh, in New York because that was the only other place on the road that I could have it processed without sending it back to LA. And uh, so I got to New York and saw that everything was okay, you know, and was grateful. And then just continued my journey. But it was interesting because curators would let me plug into their wall socket. Like they really, for three and a half months, they did kind of help me along the road. This is Harry, uh, Flipper, Tanya, and Chloe in San Francisco. And with it, I wanted to kind of ground it in a language of photography and create a series of still lives that go with it. So this is a lesbian cocktail party. cutting board. And also within it, it's important to prove that lesbians have as much style as gay men. So, great, this is good, you guys are laughing. Um, this is a great, great letter about George Bush and anarchy and, uh, and washing plastic turquoise dishes. Um, that was in a collective household. And the other thing is I didn't want them all to be couples. I didn't want domesticity to be just placed on the notion of a heterosexual model of coupledom. I really felt it was very important also to have households. And then for all of those who are confused what a lesbian washer and dryer looks like, this is a lesbian washer and dryer. And I actually had a question one time, and I, lo I love that you guys laughed, because I had a question. I was in, uh, I was in uh, Tennessee giving a lecture, and this really, you know, I, God bless her, a sweet woman raised her hand, and she goes, I'm sorry, but what is a lesbian washer and dryer? <laughs> and I said, well, that, that's kind of the point of why I say that, is because, uh, you know, I'm talking about equality and that every washer and dryer is a washer and dryer, even a lesbian washer and dryer, and she was like, oh, I thought maybe th that you had special washer and dryers. And I was like, no, there's nothing special about w our washer and dryers. There really isn't. So from that, um, a series that is still in process, and maybe one day I'll finish it, is a body of a work titled American Cities. And this is an installation of them at the Guggenheim. You could see that I had American Cities in one room and then in the same uh, shape of the alcove that the uh, self-portraits hung with Dyke, um, I hung the, um, the uh, freeways. And it was really important as if you almost you teared down the side of the museum that there was this rhythm and this, this sense in relationship to going to the four floors. Um, 
So American Cities is really dealing with the specificity of identity and relationship to city. I think that every city has its its you know moments in which that you realize like that this is you know what identifies it. And again, it's the moments that often we don't want to look at or are not iconic. So the history of Los Angeles might be thought of through Man's Chinese Grauman's Theater or Griffith Park Observatory or Santa Monica Beach. But for me, Los Angeles is you know, realized in relationship to the mini malls. That the mini malls hold the American dream, so to speak, in them. That once you go out to the suburbs, you see the Jamba Juice, the Noah Bagel, the Starbucks. But the mini mall, these strip malls in LA, hold the identity of that neighborhood and of that community, and to a certain extent, you know, still, still hanging on to this notion of the American dream in relationship to an immigrant culture. So this is Koreatown. So I map these, the spaces of LA out in relationship to idea of community through the facade of the mini mall. This is uh, South Central. Little Armenia, and then we're going to skip to St. Louis. St. Louis' relationship to the specificity of identity in this body of work, and obviously there's many more photographs in these series, but if I were to show you all of them, you would like shoot yourself in the head. But, um, but St. Louis dealt with its kind of mystique and its moment in, in terms of the World's Fair, the 1904 World's Fair. And in a certain way, St. Louis has never gotten beyond that moment of its own history. So I was mapping that out, and I did not have to go early Sunday mornings like I do on most of the American cities. St. Louis was utterly empty. Like, this is the middle of the afternoon on Friday. And I'm really interested in the American cities as being this kind of survey of the possibility of um, the failure of the American dream to a certain extent in relationship to economic boom and bust that we see that happens throughout American cities. This is the existing fence from the World's Fair. These are all uh, shot with a uh, photograph with a 7 by 17 inch banquet camera that Keith Canham made for me, for those camera people out there. And uh, then the 717 negatives, I was originally going to platinum print them like the freeways, but I realized that they needed to be much bigger and they really needed to hold in a certain way. And so I went ahead and at this point it's, you know, 96, 97, so I had them drum scanned and then they were all printed iris prints, which was the prettiest way to print black and white at that point. But I trade developed all the film myself and all of that good stuff. You can't do uh, St. Louis without at least having an arch image in there. It's sacrilegious. Um, with Minneapolis, it was the skyways. So what identified that as in, in terms of its specificity of identity. You can walk seven and a half miles or more through downtown Minneapolis without uh, going outside. And the skyways, to, in a certain way, evoked this other kind of connectivity of community and culture in the same way that the freeways do for me in a certain way. And they're just structurally kind of unbelievable. And then when I was making these uh, images in, in, um, in Minneapolis, 9-11 happened. And at the time that 9-11 happened, I was actually living in New York and teaching at Yale. Um, and I had just finished photographing Wall Street, but God bless America kind of banners went up everywhere in every American city. And then Wall Street, this is a very interesting thing and the same thing that happened with the freeways and so fascinating in terms of, I often regard photography's importance in relationship to a history that we go to much later. I often don't think that, even though I'm obviously interested in contemporary art, that photography is not necessarily about the present, even though we're making it as artists in the present, but that it holds a certain kind of significance in relationship to the idea of memory in terms of our past. And when I was photographing Wall Street, it had absolutely nothing to do with 9-11 because it hadn't happened yet. But a week after I photographed the trade towers and this site, 9-11 happened. And immediately the body of work, which I was planning an exhibition for in New York, became a site of memorial. The work literally became a site of memorial. 
And in the same way of my friends passing away from AIDS to a certain extent, even though that the notion of the importance of that history is so important to me, there was a certain kind of presence in it. So I began to realize that in, to a certain extent for someone who hung on to like, you know, Lewis Hine and Walker Evans and Dorothea Lange and thinking about um, what that meant in terms of my knowledge of American culture in terms of its history, that there is something that's unbelievably fragile to a certain extent of the act of bearing witness. And at this point, I'm realizing that I'm beginning to kind of change the way that I'm talking about work and the way that I'm thinking about work, that there is something that is no longer necessarily about the history that I imagine that I'm recording for the people that are, you know, will, I'll, will be there looking at the work when I'm gone, um, but that it is about also this presence. Um, but it, it was hard because even though the work kind of evoked Bernice Abbott and evoked a lot of other ideas in relationship to photographing New York, and specifically Wall Street, um, it was, you know, I was thinking about things when I was making this, about making these kind of Western panoramics in relationship to a, a city that's utterly disgust in relationship to its verticality. And I was like really like working out on the idea that this is one of the most like expensive pieces of real estate in the world and, you know, that it can have this, this kind of wonderful way of looking timeless to a certain extent, and, but have moments of modernity popping up in it. And then this is the, uh, the foot of the trade towers. And then after Wall Street, I photographed Chicago. And Chicago's specificity of identity was in relationship to the architecture and how it's lit at night. So they're all taken at night, and Chicago is the only city that I know in this country that takes an enormous amount of time thinking, hiring lighting designers in terms of lighting the buildings. And so I, I went through it and, and began like making this body of work that again kind of nodded to what we know as iconic, such as the Mies van der Rohe that's on Lake Shore Boulevard. But also that the Mies van der Rohe is, holds the same importance in my, my mind as what Lower Wacker does. And Lower Wacker is the kind of street that all the cab drivers know to get around the loop quicker. Like it's the where, how everything gets delivered in relationship to the downtown loop in, in Chicago. And then with this, um, I did the uh, four seasons of Lake Michigan. So there was about uh, maybe 18 photographs of Chicago and then with it the four seasons of Lake Michigan. Because you can't do a body of work on Chicago and leave out the lake. The lake is forever present. So in 2000, after doing a lot of bodies of work on cities and road trips and you know thinking about things, my dear friend Ron Athey and the Estate Project for AIDS uh, asked me if I wanted to make a body of work uh, solely for Ron that would be sold for Ron and the money would go directly to him for his performance work. And I had photographed Ron for years. He was a dear friend of mine. And I said, yeah, I'd be interested in doing that. And, uh, you know, but entice me more. And so they found the largest Polaroid camera in the world to have me work with, which was, which was 42 inches by 10 feet Polaroids. And it took a whole room for this camera, it was a room with a lens mounted to the wall that you couldn't focus. So in order to focus, the subject had to be moved in and out. And I built this whole series of stage risers. And for two days in a blizzard in New York City, I made this body of work for Ron. And they're all based on Ron's performances, but it's completely also my aesthetics in relationship to backdrop and kind of looking at fabric and things like that that I worked really hard on with Ron. Uh, this, a lot of them also connote a certain history of photography. This piece was made not only because Ron does a performance in relationship to pearls and his butt, but, um, but you can derive also that it's utterly a nod to Maplethorpe's self-portrait in terms of the whip. This is titled Suicide Bed.
This is divinity fudge as a chandelier, and each one of these chandelier pieces are pierced onto him. And then every exhibition that had, and you won't again see all of the work in this, but every, every moment of an exhibition needs its moment of silence. And Lee Bowery, the performance artist, had given Ron this cape. And I had draped it over the chair as the pause, as the place of memory, as the moment of silence in the body of work. And then here's Ron wearing the cape with the crown of thorns in his head. This piece of Ron um, was called Human Printing Press, and it's basically what kicked him out of the United States in terms of funding. Uh, the NEA had given a small amount of money to the Walker, and Ron did this performance at the Walker and then was just nailed hard, you know, again, this is by the, the culture wars. And so this is a, a, you can see the history of cutting on Daryl's back from all the years of doing this performance in Europe. And then this is just, again, not out of any performance, but just out of the body and the black background. And then Pieta. And then just a regular portrait of Ron to bring it down again. And this just shows how they were installed in the Guggenheim. So in 2001, um, when I was making the uh, Skyways, I was also starting to make the Ice Houses. And I would say that the Ice Houses were a very pivotal body of work for me in terms of something that I can't let go of in terms of exploring. And I've done many bodies of work of water at this point, and there's a real love of exploration. And I'm always interested when an artist picks up a gesture and they kind of can't get rid of it, you know? And every once in a while, like people say to me, so are you going to still do water and horizon line in the middle? And I'm like, yeah, I'm kind of not done with it yet. And every time I, I kind of do it, I find something new in it. I just completed a body of work for the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, in which I photographed off of Sandusky, Ohio, where I grew up, Lake Erie. And it's just, uh, you know, just the four seasons. I flew in and out of Ohio all through the, all the four seasons and just did this very amazing 22 photograph piece that's installed in this perfectly white modernist hallway that's a permanent installation at the Cleveland Clinic. And for me, it's like this ethereal moment that people can connect to, that they might be having, you know, a good time or a bad time or all of these things or they might want, not want to go to the chapel at the hospital but yet they can have this moment, this quietness, this pause with that work. But it all started with the Ice Houses in 2001. And I went out there, and I grew up uh, you know, hanging out with my grandpa in his ice house on Lake Erie. And, uh, and I, I you know, wanted to make this body of work in relationship to the specificity of identity in, in Minneapolis. And so I started, and I started on, you know, doing horizontals, like typical landscapes, like the horizontal landscape. And then they were blue skies, and then I was just working with the work in my studio and realized that I loved it white on white, and I loved it um, in terms of it being vertical versus horizontal, and that I wanted to keep the horizon line in the middle. So I'm out there with an 8x10 camera doing this in blizzards with golf umbrellas over me, trying to balance holders and everything. And so when all 14 of them line up in the body of work, the horizon line is utterly in the middle. And it goes from being closer up and clearer to starting for the, for the houses to go a little bit farther back into the landscape and to where they become almost invisible and ethereal and things begin to disappear. And this is all done in terms of waiting and watching weather, you guys. It's like even though it's 2001 and I could Photoshop it, I sat out there on the ice with my car on the ice waiting. And I think that waiting is a really important thing to remember that we can do. We live in a very, very fast world. And I find that in a certain way, as soon as I stopped working in the darkroom because I became pregnant with Oliver, I found that I waited more in relationship to making work. 
And I think it was all those hours in the dark room that I began to miss that all of a sudden I realized that I could get this, this kind of experience, this almost transcendental moment of, of uh, meditation in relationship to watching these minute changes happen within the landscape to make these images. So they really, you know, become very, very quiet. And then I moved back to California. I left Yale and I got it. I got tenure. Yay! <laughs> and um, went back to California. And I decided that in the same way, the, the things that I was attached to with the ice houses beyond just kind of making this body of work that worked on an aesthetic level for me was the notion of a temporary community. And the fact that on like all the lakes in Minnesota, the people who have the most money have the lake houses. But meanwhile, during that winter time, you can be the garage mechanic that goes out and pulls the, ice, the house out onto the ice and have this like little moment of a piece of real estate. And I like the idea that every winter, there might be these different formations of neighbors and different formations of community that happens on the ice. Same thing happens in the water in terms of surfing. Like whoever you're out, like sharing the waves with that day, becomes your temporary community. It becomes like this moment where you might be surfing next to Brian Grazer, but you're the dude that gets stoned every day. You know, and it's just like what happens within that I think is really important because I think we forget that we can leave our neighborhoods. We forget that we can kind of explore and create temporary communities or, or have a conversation with somebody that's beyond just texting them. You know, my, my, uh, my daughter texts me all the time. She's 31 and I pick up the phone and I call her and she's like, why didn't she just text me back? And I said, I do voices. I do, I do voices. I don't do this. <laughs> so so the, the surfers, in the same way that you wait in an ice fishing house to possibly catch a fish, which is weird, right? Um, you do the same thing. 75% uh, of surfing is waiting. It's between these sets, you know? And so I really wanted to, again, kind of recreate a different iconography of surfing. Again, to like to bring up that iconic. And so it's in these moments on foggy July mornings as people just float, which you see all the time if you go down to the PCH, where they're just floating on their surfboards, just waiting for the next set of waves come. And, you know, so I'm waiting, they're waiting, we're all waiting. And usually in terms of the iconic, we're used to the zoom lens, the, the surf not being landscape or seascape, but the surf being, you know, action. And I like that all of a sudden I kind of transformed it to this moment for us to think about it in a different way. And so it gets foggier, the figures get smaller in all 14 of them in the same way they do in the ice houses till the figure begins to disappear. And then at the Guggenheim, I got my dream where they've built out this gallery for me in which I got to hang all 14 surfers across from all 14 ice houses to create just this incredible kind of room to enter. And each, each of the, um, this is the room, and each of them, uh, there just happened to be 14 slots in the ceiling too. So it was like this perfect kind of modernist like space for me that drove me crazy and I asked if I could move a bed in there and just spend one night in that room. I just wanted that room to be like my room that I could sleep in. But they were like, nah, sorry, we really, we love you, but we can't move a bed in here for you. <laughs> in a certain way, when I was making the surfers, I was missing making portraits. And all of these people started to say to me, you know, Kathy, kind of odd, like you empty out all these American cities, you only photograph gays and lesbians, but you empty everything out. Are you trying to say something there? And I was like, oh, no, I really never ever thought about that. I'm not really trying to empty out the rest of the world. I just wanted to view these kind of moments in this architecture. And I felt like the surfers and the ice houses in a certain way were too pretty. You know, there's nothing wrong with pretty. Pretty's good, but I like a little bit of meat to it, and I felt like it needed to be grounded again back within a documentary language. Like to take something that was as ethereal and as formal as that body of work and be able to plant it somewhere that had a familiar territory to me in relationship to trying to convey 
still the importance of the idea of a document. So the portraits I did were just people right after they came out of the water from surfing. And this is Debbie. And this is Shivia. The uh, surfers are with an 8x10 camera. The portraits are with a 4x5 camera. This is Senji. Matt. Ken. Larky. Coda. Adam. Margaret. Nick. When I made a uh, self-portrait nursing, I had made this portrait back in 1995 of my best friend's uh, niece. And I always loved it, and I always wanted to make children's portraits, and I really loved this image of Jessie. And uh, you'll see Jessie later on in Girlfriends as well. She, she reappears uh, as an older uh, girl. And, uh, but I, I decided that in a, in a certain way, I didn't want to make portraits following the portrait series of my community in, in that time, and I just needed to put it aside. I was really concerned in relationship to the culture wars and how people viewed Maplethorpe's portraits of children and just the relationship of queer identity in terms of children and how people totally freak out. Like, oh, you know, not anymore, not as much. We have it on TV now. We have shows like Modern Family. <laughs> but in 95, it was a problem. So most of these are portraits of children of my artist friends, of my lesbian friends who uh, were in earlier bodies of work who have now had children, and then all these curators who found out I was making portraits of children and asked me if their children needed, you know, do I need more children for my body of work? So it's a mixture of friends that are artists, you know, my queer community, and curators. This is Beatrice. This is my niece, Kayla. And in the same way that I had a conversation with Tina Barney, I was also really interested in having a conversation with portraiture of children that was really kind of pissing me off out there. Um, should I name names? Uh, Loretta Lux, she pissed me off. I really didn't like those portraits of ch kids. And I felt that a lot of people who were using children in photographs were really kind of overtly sexualizing them in a certain way. And that really bothered me too. I was just like, you know, what's wrong with a kid just kind of almost being scared in my studio and just being who they are in that moment on a bright colored background? Like Harper, he was a little nervous. Spencer wasn't nervous. He was cool. <laughs> Kellen. McQueasy. So when they come to the studio, I have tons of color backgrounds, and I just kind of work with the color. I mean, obviously, when I'm making color portraits, I want it to be about color. So like, you know, with Kellen, she was wearing all of this blue, and so I put her on this little light blue stool with, you know, the light blue background. Nequeezy had the little red in her shirt. And Ben. Okay, so now we're going to go to a really, really far away place than portraits and American cities and all of that stuff. And, um, and that is a place that I have utterly loved and that I felt that I couldn't go back to as a photographer. Because I make such concise bodies of work and there's such formal rigor to it, I was afraid to kind of pick up a camera again and go back to how I used to photograph in San Francisco, which was street photography. Like, I loved street photography. When I lived in San Francisco, that's all I did. And then when I went to grad school and moved to LA, the practice utterly changed. And so this isn't street photography, but it's American landscape. And e I think that every photographer, to a certain extent, who is so influenced by Robert Frank and Walker Evans and Dorothea Lange, wants to give themselves that permission of the American road trip. 
I mean, there, I don't know any photographer who doesn't just want to do that American road trip unless they're just not that type of person. I guess there are those photographers out there. Um, 1999, what was happening in 1999? Before the millennium, there was this quaint fear, what I call the quaint fear now of Y2K. Remember, we were all going to lose our information. It was all going to zero down. Oh my God, I don't have any more money in the bank, blah, blah, blah. There was panic, fear. The first kind of part of another kind of cultural fear of how we are kept fearful. So I just decided before the millennium for three weeks to go in a road trip from New York across the country. The, photograph, it, the photographs are not sequential in relationship to the road trip. They are sequential in relationship to me pairing images with one another. So you have this, it opens with this sign in the landscape, peer. Because what is that language? What is peer even in relationship to the landscape? I found out it was an oil company, by the way. I had no idea. Somebody wrote me a letter on peer oil stationery that they saw my photograph and they wanted me to know that it was an oil company. So I can now know the history of peer. But for me, it was this sign in the landscape that I came upon on the road trip and just went, peer, look at the light, peer. Huh, I have to think about that. So then there's the uniconic image of the sunflowers, the back of them that you get to. And this is a book called 1999 and In and Around Home, actually, these two bodies of work. And then you get to the utterly iconic image of sunflowers. Just gestures of road. This was about uh, the back of the t-shirt, which talked about the search of knowledge. And it's the only real figure that I have in, in the um, body of work. You are about ready to experience the thrill of your life. And then every American photographer or photographer has to do the middle of the road picture. It's in our DNA. A very, very, very poorly attended Civil War reenactment. <laughs> The back of the billboard, so not like Evans and Dorothea Lange in which it was about information in the front of the billboard. At this point, it's 1999, it's Y2K, it's about disinformation. But the shadow is also a cross because there's often a kind of enormous amount of critique of the Christian right wing that seeps into my landscapes. Uh, sugar processing, uh, sugar cane processing plant, the friendly touch. Edison cleaners, swamps, and deals on wheels. So these were just taken with a, um, a Mamiya 6.7. So I had the camera back in my hand. I wasn't trying to do large format landscapes. I really wanted the freedom of having the camera back in my hand. So you can just write about your crop yields on a board no need for computers anymore. This was this amazing industrial like wasteland scene and I was so excited. The lighting was perfect. There were vines growing in it. And then I was printing it in the dark room and I realized that a uh, blurry cardboard sign says, Mark sucks donkey dick and he likes it. <laughs> yeah. And it forever changed the meaning of that photograph for me. <laughs> You know, this is uh, the ninth ward before Katrina in New Orleans. So the G's and hot dogs can be upside down. You forget the Y in candy bar. You can just add it. It's okay. <laughs> you won't lose your information there. It's all there. Old Timers Social and Pleasure Club. That's where the faculty and I are going to go after this. <laughs> this is my nod to Richter because I am like a total hardcore Gearhart Richter fan. I just saw his show at the Tate and it just like killed me. I love that also he has, he's, he's upped my studio practice in terms of how he works with his models in terms of the, you know, installing work. All of his models of the museum and the galleries now have magnetic walls and then there's the magnetic miniature work that he's placing and I'm like, oh, fuck you, Richter. <laughs> Said my to my studio assistant, we need to get magnetic walls on those models now. <laughs> the UFO cloud. 
And then this was pre-horizon line. So this was like probably like getting me thinking about that disappearing horizon line to a certain extent. So 1999 was this body of work that kind of hung out there all by itself. It was just very lost in a certain way. It showed in Portugal and it didn't show anywhere else. Like everybody was like, yeah, yeah, there's that body of work 1999, yeah. It's an odd body of work, isn't it, Kathy? And I'm like, yeah, hmm, <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> you know, thinking like all along, I, I think it's a good body of work. And, uh, and then I realized that I wanted it to have a conversation. And I was awarded the Larry Aldridge Award. And that came with an exhibition at the Aldridge Museum in uh, Connecticut. And they said, and I, I proposed to them um, that I exhibit 1999, but that I make a conversation piece with it. That I felt that it was important that often, in the same way that I think about having conversations with other artists in terms of a history that we create, that also we need to have a conversation with ourselves. And so this uh, In and Around Home deals with the re-election of President Bush and um, Katrina and the war, and w the fact that no longer are we doing the American road trip, but we've become insular. We're, more home theaters are being sold than ever before in the history of America. Uh, we, we no longer really leave home. We don't want to fly because we have to take off our shoes. You know, there's all of this stuff that's happening. There's still an incredible amount of fear. So I've photographed my home and the neighborhood around me, all within about a 20 block radius. And I live in South Central Los Angeles, but I live in a historic neighborhood called West Adams right next to USC in an old craftsman house. So this is my son, um, and this piece is, all of these are titled, all of 1999 are untitled. So all of these are titled, so this is Sunday morning breakfast, where he prefers to talk to the dogs instead of eating his scrambled eggs. This is Monica Lewinsky, a mural of Monica Lewinsky in the blue dress, I note to you all. Then with it, I did a series of Polaroids because I wanted to, again, uh, kind of mirror materiality of photography with the immediacy of media and television. So that, you know, I have always been a nightly news person. I was born in 1961. The nightly news was always on. You know, the news is where you went to. The TV news is what the first thing you, your dad did. He switched on the news when you came home. And I began to think about the nightly news and how these stories are constantly coming through our lives and then they're kind of forgotten. And so I decided to make Polaroids, SX-70 Polaroids, out of the uh, still images of the news in, rela in different things that I found on TV in relationship to using a material like Polaroid that's immediate to mirror kind of the what's happening in terms of the manipulation in digital photography and Photoshop and uh, just to you know kind of create these stories. So this is a character on the soap opera Days of Our Lives, the first one who goes off to war, Philip, who goes to Iraq. Then it's Bush thumbs up and then it's Judge Dykes because hey I was watching TV and all of a sudden I was like ha, she's Judge Dykes, how weird and I have to take a Polaroid of it. This is a blonde news reporter. This is a brunette news reporter. <laughs> this is Robert E. Lee Boulevard. This is Underwater from Katrina. This is titled Abandoned TV. This is Adelong Market. My partner, Julie, with her dog, Myra. Our daughter, Sarah, with her dog, Momo. A portrait of me with my dog, Nika, by Julie. And this was important addition because this is my dog of 16 years who traveled with me on all my road trips and knew more about me than probably Julie knew at the time, my partner. And uh, she passed away two days after this photograph was taken. So I felt like it was really important to include myself in this body of work with, with my dog. This is a neighbor's yard that says, uh, a vote against President Bush, Martin Luther King Parade, 
This is a memorial to uh, uh, one of the members of the gang in our neighborhood, the Bloods. So it's a Bloods memorial. This is titled Self-Portrait Voting. This is Terry Schiavo and the Pope. The Pope, after he passed away. This is a protest against 31 sex offenders living in a house in our neighborhood that the neighbors protested against, feeling that 31 sex offenders in one house was maybe just a little bit too many in our neighborhood. <laughs> this is a USC tailgate party. <laughs> it's okay, they're all messed up, man. <laughs> Look at them, they can't even play any bowl games. They're really messing up. This is Martin Luther King Parade. These three images you will see towards the end of um, the lecture really informed a place that I wanted to go within the work. This is Rumsfeld defending the war, Cindy Sheehan's protest stop the war, uh, that was the most deaths in Iraq with the coffins on TV and, and the occupation of Iraq. This is Oliver in a tutu. This is titled Purple Finger. At the State of the Union address, the younger members of the House of Representatives dipped their fingers in purple ink in relationship to a solidarity of bringing democracy to the people of Iraq. I say it's the white hand of democracy. And within, within it, I framed slowly with the, why it's a triptych is slowly the Iraqi uh, national appears next to the white hand of democracy. This is Bush Doctrine Spread Liberty. And even though I had lots of photographs of Carrie, um, this ended up being the photograph I used because when I was making the body of work, we already knew the election, the results of the election. This is Christmas in West Adams. This flag hung outside of my house for eight years. It said, we the people say no to the Bush agenda. This is titled Debate. This is titled Talking to the Bush. <laughs> Three crosses and a shadow. Terry Schiavo, a religious experience. Stolen Converses, where this young girl stole this pair of red Converses. She's holding the box in her hands, but the, her, uh, the, her parents called the police on her. And so the police are on the corner talking about what to do with the stolen Converses. And then our cat Cootie is as sad as her. This is titled, Bush Smiles, Help Us. <laughs> USC tailgate still life. I think you guys probably do a much better job decorating. <laughs> sure you don't put it in front of danger high voltage areas. <laughs> Neighborhood pupus area. Neighborhood garage. Ice cream truck. The other day I had um, 40 collectors from Boston in my studio. My studio is behind my house in West Adams. It's always so interesting. They came in one of those big black limo buses because they were, you know, important Boston collectors. And, uh, and after the studio visit, they walked outside and it just so happened that the ice cream truck was passing, like dingling its little ice cream truck, truck tune. And all of them raced to buy, like, <laughs> That ice cream truck guy was the happiest guy. Like, all, uh, he just made a killing that day. Confirmation hearing of Judge Roberts. Jesus carved out of a stump or a tree. Oliver and Stingray. My studio and Suzanne's work. The work that you see in the background is a friend of mine from New York who I was in between bodies of work, so I often 
to good friends loan out a studio and I have a nice guest room and they come out and they do a little residency. Fire trucks, LAPD helicopter, and then it ends on optimism with a rainbow flag. And in the Guggenheim, you went through in and around home, and then you ended up in the Ron Athey Polaroid room. And the other thing that I did is it was the fourth floor, the top floor that the Polaroids were in. So if people chose not to walk the rotunda through getting through the floors, because I was in the tower, then the first room that they came off into was the Polaroids and then in and around home. So I really had to think about how to install those. Okay, 2007 and 2009, I did a body of work uh, for three years titled High School Football. A lot of my friends were like, what? What are you doing? And I was like, well, I actually really like football. And they're like, really? And I'm like, yeah, I kind of really do. But it really started out by the fact that my partner, Julie, is from a small town in Louisiana. And she's the middle of eight kids. And those eight kids have, have made about 24 nieces and nephews that I have. And all of those nephews play football because they live in Louisiana. And we were going on in August to Louisiana for a 10-day trip. And I was like, what am I going to do? So I called up my nephews and I asked if I could start watching their high school football practices and photographing them. And I kind of fell in love with it. I kind of became really, really fascinated with it. And in a certain way, in what American cities do and what the, um, what the ice houses and surfers begin to do is, again, in that relationship to creating an iconography, is I've always really been interested in American genre painting. And one of the things that I felt that I wanted to do with high school football, in the same way that football is all about the camera overhead looking down at the players, or the, the action shot of the moment. Um, I wanted to make landscapes because I felt that the high school football field was truly a site of American landscape. And so I wanted to bring that kind of discussion to fruition. So this was, I'm sorry, I'll tell you where it was. I, so I traveled all around America. Uh, this is uh, Fairfax High in Los Angeles. This is Louisiana. This is Alaska. So I'm not shooting large format. So at this point, I can't shoot large format because there's no way that I can like wander around on the sidelines of the football field uh, with a 4x5 camera and holders. And so I won an award. I love winning awards. And it was a, it was a good award that, that gave me a lot of money that uh, uh, allowed me to buy a Hasselblad H2 with a phase 45 plus back. So it's a 50 megapixel back, and, but I'm shooting with an 80 millimeter lens, so I'm out there with these sport photographers, right, with these big 400, 300 millimeter lenses, and they're looking at me, and they're like, what kind of camera is that? And I'm like, oh, it's a Hasselblad. And they're like, well, what's the back? And I'm like, it's a phase one. And they're like, uh, isn't that a studio camera? And I said, oh, I guess most people use it as a studio camera. And they're like, uh, wh wh what are you doing? And I'd be like, I'm making landscapes. Uh, oh, you're making landscapes. And I'm like, yeah, I'm making football landscapes. And they're like, OK. And then they go down the end of the field <laughs> far away from me. Uh, this is uh, my old high school in Poway, California. I moved out uh, from Sandusky, Ohio when I was 13 to Poway. And this just happened to be this kind of glorious, rainy game. This is 29 Palms uh, in the desert where 75% of the kids on this team, both parents are deployed to both Iraq and Afghanistan. No longer Iraq, but at that point when I was making the work. And as I made it for three years, in terms of other work that I was making, and, and I think the, kind of the inklings of thought that I had in terms of Wall Street, that I realized that this was beyond kind of creating a new iconography of American landscape, that it was truly a discourse in terms of bearing witness, that I realized that these young men who aren't getting college scholarships and going on to you know, be football players in other places 
the majority of them were joining the military. And, and it became, I became really aware of kind of the same kind of vulnerability that is held within this community of young men um, that goes beyond kind of the extreme notions of masculinity and the stereotypes that are attached to that, but that there was this really kind of amazing vulnerability in these young men. This is Staten Island. This is Texas. 29 Palms again. The prints, just so you know, in terms of scale, are about 48 by 63 inches. So they really, the prints themselves hold as landscapes. This is, I said Ohio. This is Hawaii. And then like with the surfers, I wanted to make a series of portraits. So this is David, Austin, and Bryant. Brandon. Andrew. And I like the vulnerability that came up. I like that it was also after practice, so just like after surfing, I got them, not after games, because nobody's going to sit around for me after games. They're either depressed because they lost, or they're like totally want to go party because they won. Quadir, Seth, and um, everybody who posed for me, I would send an 8 by 10 photograph back uh, to the team and to their family. And uh, I, I later got um, letters, from, and this is when I realized that it was another way of bearing witness and this certain kind of vulnerability of what, the, what, you know, what it is to be a country at war for so long, is that parents wrote me how meaningful their portrait was of their son because their son had been killed in Afghanistan. And I, that weight of that was very different where a lot of people were kind of wanting to identify the work in relationship to my butchness and my exploration of masculinity. And it was never really about that. It was really about this exploration of, you know, not only landscape, but trying to make this portraits of this, what I considered, you know, somewhat of a, a not stereotypical, um, fragile group of young men. Blaine, doesn't he look like a Blaine? Stephen. Brock, JD, Sean, Adam, Robbie. This one I love because the motion behind the players still on the field. And it reminds me of Paul Cabanegro's deer, running deer photograph. There's like this moment that I just was like, oh my God, it's like running deer. That's a geeky photo thing, never mind. Josh, and this becomes like a Bronzino. Dusty. Gino. Kevin. But like this pose, you know what I mean? It's just like there's this other thing that happens with these. Tyler, right? I mean, Tyler. He's never going to play college ball. He's not coming to Oregon. You know, that's right. But you got to love that he's going for it. Micaiah and Cruz. Same with John. Leon. Rusty, and the last one, Josh. So I was in Alaska in 2007 to do this residency. Whoops, sorry. And the residency was a USA artist residency. And I was supposed to do a theater piece and work with a playwright. And I was all excited because I wanted to make a body of work of photographs that would be used as a background for a staging of a very kind of uh, 
you know, ethereal conversation about nature. Like just a, almost like just this kind of, you know, stream of consciousness, one act play. When I got there, they put me up in this house where the guy was out of town. And there was a house they found. And I was like, okay, this is cool, you know. And then I went over to the theater to talk to them. And they were like, well, you know, we got some bad news. And I'm like, what? And they're like, uh, we both quit our jobs, the theater director and the artistic director. And I was like, oh, uh, okay, well, what, what does this mean for our project? And they were like, well, it's not going to happen. I was like, oh, oh, okay, well, here I am in Alaska for, you know, 15 days in Juneau, and I realized that you drove five miles and it said end, and then you drove another 10 miles and it said end, and I was just there, and that was it. And so then the guy came back who owned the house because apparently he was going to put the house up for sale. And so we woke up, my assistant and I, to find him sleeping on the living room floor. And we're like, oh, uh, hi. And he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. This is my house. We're actually putting it up for sale. I just need to do some repairs. But don't worry. I'll just sleep on the floor, and you guys can have the bedrooms. And Nicole and I look at each other, and we're like, this is awkward. <laughs> this is really, really awkward. The theater director quit. Do we go back home? What do we do? And so we just decided to check into a hotel and take little planes around Alaska and just, you know, make work. So this is a, a photograph at Mendenhall Glacier. And I really thought that this was a really complicated photograph in a very interesting way because even though it was made in 2008, it utterly looks photoshopped. And I really loved that all of a sudden I was like trying to think about these landscapes that began to almost evoke this, this question of whether or not, again, it is real. Like, what is this kind of truth? And then I made this piece in, in, in uh, actually, I, I gave it to the author. Um, Rebecca Solnit is one of my favorite kind of authors to talk about landscape. I think that everybody in here should read The Field Guide to Getting Lost and pretty much all of her books. And so this piece is titled The Blue of Distance. And it's slowly, it's a, it's a body of work that, that goes together in this sequence and it's basically slowly kind of going on this boat, you know, towards these little islands. And then with it, I made this other body of work, which is one piece titled The Edge of Time. And this is a really complicated visual piece because what I did was the half of the photograph always appears in the other half of the photograph. So I'm timing it as the boat is going along the shore in relationship to trying to create a fractured landscape. And I think in a lot of ways that I thought about the ice houses, and surfers also as a fractured panorama of what happens in terms of fracturing a landscape and trying to pull out metaphors in terms of nature and where we are at this point. And so when you stand before it, you can really kind of figure it out, but it's hard to figure out up here. And then this is titled Grizzly Bear and Wolves. And I love that it's titled this because there are a mother grizzly bear and her cubs surrounded by a pack of wolves. And we're so used to the Na National Geographic in relationship to these kind of action shots. And again, it comes to what we know as iconic as images. And I love that all of a sudden in this landscape, there's these little black dots down there that represent a grizzly bear and wolves that you would never really think that that's what it is. But when you're out there, they are only in the landscape like that. It's not like you're going to walk up and, you know, photograph this pack of wolves surrounding the grizzly bear and her cubs. So I love that kind of like metaphor. OK, we're almost done, I swear to god. Girlfriends. I made girlfriends. A lot of these images were uh, exhibited in Portland. And girlfriends was a body of work that I showed at Barbara Gladstone Gallery in New York. And, um, and it was trying to make a body of work of iconic butch lesbians. And I wanted to use the word girlfriends for several reasons. One, a lot of my butch friends would never call themselves a girl. Two, it was in response to Richard Prince's girlfriends in terms of these iconic butcher, uh, biker girls and trying to create a different kind of idea of girl. And uh, just 
again, make portraits of my friends. So Eileen Miles, Harry Dodge, Idexa, who I've photographed a lot over the years, J.D. Sampson, who was in La Tigra and is now in a, a group called Men, Kate from the L Word, Idexa again, Daphne, Daniela C. And in this time, I really wanted to not just make them all in the studio, but it was important to begin to create environments, you know, that to, to photograph them in their own environments. But I wanted this, like, different discourse between the studio work and kind of what it meant to be in the environment. This is Jenny Shimutsu. I remember that portrait of Jessie when she was a young girl. This is Jessie now, so I used the same green background and just, like, photographed her as she is now. Pig pen. Pig pen again. Lindsay Brant and her dog Miss B. Kate. Jenny. Katie, Julie, and then with it I pulled out for the first time, I went into my archive, and I've never really had much relationship to my archive, I mean I photograph all the time, I have tons and tons of images that are never used, and I had been making these since about 1982, and they were always a little bit too close to Maplethorpe to a certain extent. And they are little, I just made them little 8 by 8 silver gelatin prints, and then they're matted with eight ply mats, and they're just these kind of little moments that are very, very intimate, and uh, very much just this part of my life of when I would pick up my Hasselblad in the studio, and just, you know, out of the, that conversation. So they're, you know, people that I've gone out with that are in hotel rooms, studio shots, and they just begin to be this like little personal moment out of my archive. So this is Daphne, pig pen, pig pen again, Pam, Raven, Pig pen, Marusia, Kate, Veronique, Hans. Hans. A very young me, Kate, Hans. So this body of work is much more in a certain way about desire than the earlier portraits. Amy, Julie. Melissa, JD, Raven. And then when I was in grad school, you guys, this is what I looked like and what I did. <laughs> this is my days at CalArts, Raven. Gabrielle, the Cap Street household, Ian, and then we're rounding up to the end here. Twelve miles to the horizon. Um, 
This is, this is a funny photograph that Dong and I did. I was going on this ship, right? And it was this other prize that I won where all of a sudden I get this phone call and I've been nominated by Kathy Halbright at MoMA um, to uh, make a body of work for Hanjin shipping. So they said, oh, you know, you won this award. I was like, oh, an award, okay, what's the award? And they're like, well, Hanjin Shipping wants to uh, give you X amount of money and they get the first edition of the work, which is the new way of corporate collecting, by the way, you guys. And, uh, and you have, but you have to go on a container ship, either from the port of Long Beach to Busan, Korea, or from Busan, Korea to Long Beach. And I said, oh, interesting, okay, yeah, yeah, I can write a proposal about that. That could be kind of interesting. I knew I didn't get seasick, I love the water. And so I asked a student of mine who's Korean to go with me because they, I would say, well, what do I need? And the, 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 corporate, the, cor the headquarters, the corporate, I don't know, well, well, the ship is really dirty. I'm like, okay, the ship is really dirty. And I was like, well, Dong, will you go with me? Because obviously you are Korean and I can't speak Korean. And what if I need to talk to somebody? And Dong's like, okay, I'll go. And I said to Dong, well, we better get uniforms because the ship is dirty. <laughs> so this is us in our uniforms, which I had, uh, which three times I sent his back because they just wouldn't believe his name was Dong. So his pocket says Doug, even though three times I tried to get it to say Dong, D-O-N-G. They just, the company wouldn't do it. But the, the hats say Hanjin Artist. So what my proposal was, this is leaving the port of Busan, is that I photograph every sunrise and I photograph every sunset on the journey. So the first 10 are sunrises and the second 10 are sunsets. And it was always about the sun being in the middle. And I worked with a navigator of where the sun would come up and where I would have to place my camera on deck. And there were twice in that in which the ship uh, actually got in. The ship was th the biggest thing I've ever been on in my entire life. It held 5,800 shipping containers. Um, and then what I liked about it was you, sometimes you set these rules for yourself as an artist. You know, like the idea that the most cliche thing you can do in photography is photograph sunrises and sunsets. But on this journey, there wasn't always a sunrise or sunset. And that was, that was perfectly good with me. Like I was so happy about that because I didn't want it to just be seeped within this cliche. And so, you know, there were moments in which there was just utter fog, but the sun was there in the dead center if it was to rise. And then the other side of the ship, Dong was seasick the entire time. <laughs> he was utterly useless. And the entire crew was Filipino. <laughs> and the captains were German, <laughs> who wouldn't even talk to me or acknowledge me. And I was the only woman aboard. And the last night of the journey, they did invite me into their like kind of wreck area, the officers, and we did karaoke together and drank whiskey. But it was really kind of amazing because I would get up and I would get up in the morning, it would be myself and the first mate and he'd always make me coffee and I'd go out on deck with a tripod and the camera and I would be there for three hours in the morning watching the light slowly change and then I would do the same thing where I would be there for three hours at night. And it is this thing that happens in terms of waiting but there were moments in which it was incredibly cold like when I went up around the Aleutians. The only time I saw land was when I passed Japan and we came into California. The rest of the time, it was really out in sea. The food was horrendous, uh, really. I, one day, I, I get my dinner, and it's this chicken broth with a really overcooked hot dog kind of in the middle of the bowl like this. And I was like, ah, dinner. <laughs> so this is the last uh, sunrise. And then this is the first sunset. And this summer, they, or last summer, they were in an exhibition at the ICA in Boston that there's a catalog of that uh, Helen Molesworth, great curator, uh, did. And the, body, the, the, the exhibition was called Empty and Full. 
So she surrounded the entire gallery with these uh, seascapes of sunrises and sunsets. And in the middle of the gallery, she created these T's that held all of this political work that I've been doing. And so one of her kind of quandaries in relationship to it was what is empty, this sea that we look out at, or these kind of groups of people in relationship to the notion of democracy in America. And it's not an exhibition I, I would have set up, but one of the great things about working, this is arriving to the port of Long Beach, one of the great things about working with a very, very good curator is sometimes they can draw things out of your work that you wouldn't necessarily put together. And I very rarely trust curators. This sounds horrible, but I like some of them I'm just like, nah, you kind of can't do that. Now the work doesn't work that way. You know, and I'm very defined as an artist in terms of my ideas behind the work. But with Helen, I utterly trust, trust her opinions, and she did a very interesting thing. So around the gallery were these sunrise and some sunset, and in big T's were these political images. And this is an immigration march. And remember when I uh, said these crowd shots uh, in, um, in and around home? This is, was the catalyst of starting to make these, of filling up the city again. Uh, this is an anti-war protest. This is a Tea Party rally. Again, Tea Party rally. And then a new book that just came out, which is 100 Images, uh, which I don't have, obviously. I'm not going to do that to you right now. Uh, but is inauguration, but it was just published by Greg Miller, and it's 100 images of the inauguration of Barack Obama, and I made it 100 images in relationship to having a conversation with Eggleston's election eve. And so this is all from the inauguration. And one of the things that interests me is within the idea of democracy, and in certain kind of, um, again, iconic and information, the American flag is completely represented. So in one moment, the American flag is in relationship to want to become uh, citizens of America through, in relationship to immigration. The next moment, the American flag is used to cover coffins. You know? And so it's really interesting to me, these kind of gestures. And the book inauguration, there's all these amazing American flags waving. And then the next moment when the, na the mall clears out, so many of them have been discarded in the dirt. And then there's Boy Scouts going around and picking up these American flags. And it's just like, OK, what? so in one moment, you can have this utter patriotism. And then the next moment, like, where is that conversation? Uh, this is Prop 8 rally. Oh, I'm not supposed to show that picture. I got sued. I, I forgot to take it out of the lecture. You didn't see that. Um, first time I've ever been sued, I, I was forced to take the image out of uh, the museum for the ICA exhibition. Uh, I went to uh, Michigan Women's Music Festival and photographed it. And apparently, you're not allowed to have cameras and take photographs there, even though when you Google Michigan Women's Music Festival and you look on Flickr, there's hundreds of thousands of images. But these two women were very upset that I represented them in this exhibition. So they uh, sued me to remove the image. And they also wanted me to destroy my catalog, which I didn't do. Um, so this is also Mishfest, but then you can't see the women. But I'll show it to you really quick, because you have to think about it in relationship to the Boy Scouts. So I'm gonna just you're going to see it, but I didn't show it to you, OK? So there's this, which utterly just makes me think of Manet. And then the tents of the Michigan Women's Music Festival. And then the tents of the 100th anniversary of the Boy Scouts of America and their jamboree. And then the Boy Scout jamboree. And then this image was placed, the, the Mish, Mishfest image that I wasn't supposed to show you. I love saying that. Um, is placed in juxtaposition with this image. 
you know. So it's just like this really interesting thing. It was so interesting to me that the women wanted to silence their presence at this time period in which it was a, a huge exhibition that included Tea Party and Boy Scouts and about democracy and kind of groups and community in America. Okay, I'm going to end on this this summer because I wasn't going to end on this, but then I, somebody told me that you used the self-portrait of me on the log to advertise the lecture. So I thought I'd better show the New Zealand work. So this is a grid of all of these kind of um, very tourist things uh, that you think of in New Zealand. So you have the oversized bronze kiwi. You have the sheep show. Now a lot of people think this is a diorama. It's not. Those are live sheep and live dogs on stage. <laughs> you have lots of bubbling holes in New Zealand. Really good place for bubbling holes. You have vinyl banners talking about oranges and cows. And then with it are these kind of more moments that are about not tourism, but about my moments that I had for six weeks in New Zealand. This is a young grad student that I was working with named Sophie, who it felt like very much like it could be a self-portrait of me when I was in my 20s. This is a place that I'm going to be going with in my work that I did as a gesture in New Zealand, and now I've become utterly fascinated with it. And this is, a, this is titled Abstract Landscape. And so it's this com completely iconic place in New Zealand with a rainbow and everything, but by simply for me kind of uh, racketing out the focus, it, it felt that I could make this image simply because it no longer was about this utter cliche beauty, that it, it contained these other moments of trying to find something out of a place of memory. And so I'll be making these abstract landscapes in the next year or two. And then this is Joyce Campbell, her husband John, who was a Beverly Hills lawyer, and now he's faking fixing fences. He doesn't really know how to fix And their daughter Queenie and their son Mo on the log. Mo wanted to sit on the log because I had this whole log thing in New Zealand. The whole time I was there, I had to chop wood to keep warm because it was winter. Uh, this is Piha Beach. And then in the installation, this self-portrait was looking out at the sea. So these two were on the, the same wall, this incredible seascape of a storm with that self-portrait. And since you came in with this on the banners, I end with this. And I will be happy to answer any questions. And thank you very much again. We can turn up the house lights. Are we OK? You guys hanging in there? I know, just adjust your eyes. We can all blink a little bit together and look bad. But are there any questions? Yes. No, I didn't know anybody, just like I didn't know the football players. I just, I just introduced what I was doing. I told them I was making a body of work and uh, wanted to make portraits of surfers. And uh, I, I was a surfer all through high school and, and taught surfing as well. And you know, just really liked that moment of coming out of the water, that kind of exhaustion, and just like what that looks like. And just felt like that usually isn't you know, imaged. And so it was just, so a lot of people said no, but the ones who said yes said yes, and, and they, they actually didn't get prints because nobody really wanted to give me their address or anything, so. And then did you specifically tell them how they looked like all of them had strong faces? And That's common throughout my work, but they, none of them really smiled anyway. And I think that if I, 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 what I do is I usually prompt somebody to go into their head. I'm really interested in this aspect of what happens when you go to a place of thought and then trying to get a portrait from that place of thought. So I just ask them to think about what their, what their experience was like in the water today. 
So I just kind of said, you know, I'll just either think about the best wave that you took or like what you thought about when you were sitting on the board and just go to that place in your head. And then I made the portraits. And I would shoot about four sheets of four by five film on each person because I didn't want them to be standing there a long time trying to get like this portrait. It had to be this immediate moment. And same with the football players. They were very immediate. There's probably about three to four frames of each football player. Fishing? <laughs> no, I stand out there with my camera. Like I, I, you know, every once in a while I might turn on the car if I feel really cold, but I'm, I'm, I know how to dress in the winter. You know, like I wear really good winter clothing. <laughs> and I have like hand warmers inside my gloves, and but I'm a lot, I have, you know, removable gloves for my fingertips and stuff. And, uh, and I would just kind of hang out on the ice and just watch and try to protect. The, the only thing that I was trying to protect during the really heavy, heavy snow where it was like white on white was just the camera with golf umbrellas. And I carry my 8x10 film holders in a little Playmate cooler that you can swing the lid down and just grab your holder out. So, yeah. But no, I don't listen to music. I never really listen to music, honestly. I mean, in the car when I'm driving around LA, but when I'm working, I never just play my, I just, I just want to be kind of in the element. Yeah? <coughs> only from the women from the Mishfest, yeah. The only censorship I've ever had in my entire life was asking, by them asking to remove the photograph. And they wouldn't talk to me directly, they only talked to me through lawyers. And I had the lawyer up, and I was in New Zealand, and it was it cost me about twenty five hundred dollars worth of cell phone calls to deal with this this past summer, uh, with the curator and with lawyers, and the museum had the lawyer up, and it was like a really really big deal, and uh, Helen Molesworth happens to be you know a lesbian as well, so both of us were just like utterly in shock that this was coming from our own community. And you know we were crying. We we're and we were like, of course we have to take it down because I said, and then, and then I wrote an apology because it showed in the Advocate, and that's how they found out about it. Is the Advocate uh, printed it, and so then I wrote a public apology because all these women were just trashing me on the internet, like just like, like saying that I needed to go back to Mishfest this summer, and stand at the gates and apologize to every woman, and hand out the photography policy. I, you know, and I was just like, oh, God, wow. I've never had this happen before, you know? I mean, I've, like, taken so many photographs in my life, and I've never had this happen. And I would expect it more from Texas families who all of a sudden found out, like, about other work and then, like, be like, no, why'd you photograph my son? But, you know, none of that ever. No, it came from my own community. But no, no censorship ever. Only that. Everybody ready for a drink? I oh, know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, first of all, I, I really appreciate the, the, the sense of freedom in the, the mode of content, and, and, and it's it's very permission given, and I appreciate that. I talk about scale. How do you how do you think about scale when you're working with a body of work that is the finished scale of the presentation? I think it, there's different ways to think about scale. One of them is from a kind of a history perspective of scale. So when it's landscape, you know, such as the football <laughs> landscape, they need to be big to hold that kind of presence of landscape. And then other things just need to be smaller, to be quiet, to be intimate. And I really think about them in relationship to not only kind of a, a history of both painting and photography in terms of how work is represented in scale, but then the emotion that I want to convey with the body of work to the viewer. So with the little 8x8 black and whites, they wouldn't have made sense big because they would have been sensational. I wanted that kind of intimacy to come in to them. So that's, that's kind of how I think about it. Oh, 
One more. Good question. No, I'm not really thinking about shock value, to be honest. Because at that point, I wasn't really exhibiting. So I was just making this work of my friends 